Greetings fellow scribes! Welcome back to the archive! This video is going to be the start of another series, a monthly series, where I go over GMing tips. Now I've been GMing since about 95, so well over 20 years, almost 25 years at the time of this video. And you know, I've learned techniques, I've GM'd a wide variety of systems, and so what I want to go over in this series of videos is GMing for specific systems. Because, you know, every system has its own little ins and outs for you know, how you GM it. Instead of focusing on any specific system, in this first video, though, I'm just going to go over a little bit of how I make my initial jamming decisions before I pick the system. So sit back, relax, and enjoy as we talk about foundational jamming. When I started jamming way back in the dark ages, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have YouTube, so we didn't have sources like this. We didn't have people like the you know, GM Tips with Satine Phoenix or Matt Mercer. We didn't have actual play videos or anything like that. What we had was basically the rule books. If we wanted to GM, we had pretty much two ways to learn. We could find another GM and basically apprentice under them, learn the ropes, you know, have them sort of act as an advisor for us. Or we could do it through trial and error. And you know, there were tools available there were places to get advice, but we couldn't just go to a website. We had to go to magazines, Dragon Magazine specifically in the US. And now I understand in the early days, White Dwarf, the Games Workshop magazine nowadays, was very much the same. A generic game magazine. Because that's the thing. Yes, Dragon Magazine was for a long time published under TSR and then later under a license to Paizo. But even though it was a corporate run magazine it was still a generic system, generic magazine. Now, for the most part, they didn't publish stuff specifically for other systems, although occasionally they would. Uh, most notably their Dragon Project, where they made dragons for a variety of systems that were out at the time. Notable entries were a Paranoia Dragon, and when they teamed up with Fossa to do a biography of Dunkelzon. But, that's neither here nor there. What Dragon Magazine really had going for it was that it had articles that were system agnostic that could be applied to any system and were great jamming tips you know you might have an article on how to defend a castle against flying creatures invisible scale wall scalers things like that you might have an article on psychotronic weaponry 
and how that interacts with hyperspace. But at the same time, you'd have articles just talking about storytelling and various things like that. And that's where many of us older GMs started off. That's where we got our advice back in the day. Believe me, I completely envy this newer generation who have access to all these great websites, all these live plays, and people giving GM tips, whether it be Nerdarchy, Deacon Sundry, you know, or any of these. But you still are learning from other GMs. You still are figuring things out yourself and trying to how to apply that to your own game. And that, ultimately, is one of the things you have to learn. I don't pretend that I can teach you what's going to work for you. What I am going to do is I'm going to tell you what I found works for me and how I do things. So, with this little bit of segue and intro out... Let's start talking about the first step of GMing any game. Deciding the system. So, as I said, the most important question before you start running a game is, what system am I going to run? And there's many ways you can decide this. You could just decide, all right, I'm going to run a Shadowrun game. Or, I'm going to run a Werewolf the Apocalypse game. Just go in right out of the gate, deciding the system and setting you're running from. But, what if you don't want to do that? What if you're starting from a perspective of, I want to run a cyberpunk game with magic. How do you do that? Well, there are a variety of ways. First, you could just grab Shadowrun. It's the default Cyberpunk with Magic game. And is the longest run and most well known. Or you can go looking around. You can look and see things that you can be creative with. You know, there are some 5th edition rule books that are being done by third parties for Dungeons and Dragons that allow someone to do magic in a cyberpunk setting. You know, there's various other games out there that have a similar thing. You can also look at Artal Saurian Cyberpunk. And then look at some of the other Art Halsorian games that are more fantastical as they use a similar system. And just take the magic elements from one and put them in to the other. That's every bit as viable. You could decide you're going to take Mage the Ascension. And use that as as your system because it's got cybernetic implants for you know the technocracy. We've got matrix. We've got the matrix in terms of the digital web or whatever it was called this edition. So you could use that. And really the question becomes, at this point, what is it you're looking for? 
do you want necessarily deep characters? Do you want a system with a lot of crunch? A lot of detail? Then Shadowrun. Do you want something that's a more punk aesthetic? Well then, work, work some mishmashing and take cyberpunk and another magically oriented art historian game. Work with those. Do you want something that the magic is extremely flexible and you know the the cyberware is noticeably more potent even though you're going to probably house rule away a lot of the philosophical stuff from mage do you want something like that then mage the ascension might be your bag and you know like I said, it's you have to decide based on really what you want, but also the amount of work you want to put in. You know, taking cyberpunk and the art story and fantasy game—that's some work. That's gonna require some pages of handwritten or hand-typed conversion notes. Mage. That's going to be requiring, again, you know, you're going to need to be writing out your house rules. It's probably not going to be as many. It's probably just going to be, hey, don't use this, 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 or this. But it's still, you're having to do a little bit of work. While Shadowrun, it's, boom, it's all right there. You just have to throw in the city. That's one way you can do it. But, hey, what if you want to run a traditional high fantasy game? I mean, there's... You've got Dungeons and Dragons. You've got Pathfinder. You've got Palladium Fantasy. You've got the Dark Eye. You've got a variety of games. So, in that case, how do you pick which one you want to run? Well, in that case, it's going to, again, go down to taste. Because, you know, Dungeons & Dragons and Pathfinder are both very straightforward editions. Straightforward games. There's not really a lot of fiddly bits for a player to look at with them and go, Huh? Palladium Fantasy? It's a more complicated game though it is still a d20 and percentile base and of course the dark eye is its own a little bit more complex system so each one though has its own emphases and biases Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder are both geared towards you're pretty much going to be building your own world. Oh yeah, you're going to be plugging their stuff in, but you're probably going to be building your own world. And they have a emphasis as well on pre-made adventures. And they have a lot of pre-made adventures. So those are probably good ones if you're a new GM. Just because they're simple, they're kind of industry standard baselines, and you can get a lot of canned modules to learn the ropes of running a game in, running a story in. But let's say you're more experienced, then you get to look at both Palladium Fantasy and The Dark Eye. And The Dark Eye is a setting that puts an emphasis on history and setting and where your character is from. Palladium Fantasy it's, it's the Palladium system with 
less powerful people. You're squishy. And that's the big thing of it. It's a simple, straightforward system. It's a PowerPoint expenditure based system. So, you know, it's really a case with any of these. It's what do you like? What system do you think you can work the best with? And that's pretty much how a new person should generally start selecting their system. Actually, how anyone should start selecting the system. It boils down to, here's the story I want to tell. What system works best for telling that story? Now, once you have decided what system you're going to run, comes the next question. What am I going to allow from that system? Because you don't want to allow every single book for most systems. Like, seriously, some systems you really need to lay down limits. And give us a moment and to talk about that. Picking what you want to allow from a system is what I consider one of the three foundational questions you have to answer. And this is because, you know, even if it's you're disallowing certain negatives or certain advantages, you're doing this Firstly, for the story, you're picking things that are not going to be allowed because of the story you're telling. You're setting the restrictions for what the players do. This is not saying, no, you can't play what you want. It's, here are the guidelines and the restrictions. I want this as a balanced game, so we're going to say this, this, and this aren't allowed. Or if you do this, you can't do this for various reasons. You know, it could be something as simple as in a Legend of the Five Rings game, you say, no players can play duplicate clans. I, you can't have two crane at the table. You can't, ha you can't have two scorpion. It's if you pick a clan, no one else can take that. It could be as simple as saying, hey, in this Pathfinder game, you all are starting as humans. Because of the village you're in, because of the culture you're coming from, this class, this class, this class, and this class are available. Okay? Or it could be you're running a Rifts game, and you're saying, Alright, I'm running Rifts. You may take... Spirit West, Spirit West 2, Core Book, Coalition, Tolkien, and Lone Star. Please don't take from anywhere else. You've narrowed the region it's going to be, focused on what books are going to be allowed. That way, you're not trying to run a Wild West game, a, a Rift's New West game, and someone's trying to play a Techno Samurai. How'd you get there? 
No, seriously, how? how? It, it, no, no. Don't don't break the GM's mind, which is why you limit books in riffs, especially in riffs. You really need to have hard limits in riffs. You know? But at the same time, you might go, Hey, look. I know it. I'm allowing everything in the core book. However, I'm not going to allow this negative or this positive. Because they're outside of the scope of my game. Like, my upcoming Shadowrun game. I have specifically told players they cannot take any of the sinner negative qualities. And I have restricted the amount of in-debt they can take. This is because it keeps it at the level I am looking at running. And you have to decide based on the story you are running what limits you wish to impose. If you wish to impose any. And how severe those restrictions are going to be. And make sure you articulate these limits well. You know, you don't want to go, Look, I'm running a Shadowrun Street Scum game. Now, I understand some of the negatives are more points than you're allowed to take. So it's... You can take those, you just don't get any points beyond... The 13. And you end up with the player going, You said we could take as many negatives as we wanted, we just didn't get any points for 13. Beyond 13. Like, no, it's if you wanted to take a large negative, that would be the only negative you could take, and you'd only get 13 points for it. But, you know, those are lessons you learn the hard way. You, know, you have to learn, you articulate things very well. You have to be precise when articulating the limits to players. Do not leave them wiggle room because... While most players are great people, there's always going to be that one person who's going to try to go, Oh, you said this, 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 and this weren't allowed, but in this thing that is allowed, it references this. No! No! Only these books only these things, or these things aren't allowed. Period. Don't even look at them. And you have to make sure your players understand things the same way you do with these limits. And from there, we move on to the third foundational thing you have to decide. The starting point. So, the starting point of a game I consider should take place during the first session. And the purpose of a starting point is twofold. First off, it sets the origin for everything. You know, if it's a case of the players are in a bar 
and the first admission, first adventure starts there. Why are they in the bar? Why did the story have them start in the bar? If the first adventure starts in just a rural, secluded, sheltered village, you have to have the hook for getting them out. The bar is the hook for getting them together. What else is going on? What else is going on in the world? But at the same time, the starting point is more than just where they meet for the first time, where the game starts with them gathered. It is also what level of play you're starting at. Are you running Fantasy Flight Star Wars game with everyone at night level? Are you running a Pathfinder game where everyone starts at first level? Or are you starting everyone at third? Are you running an Apprentices or Initiates game in Mage of the Ascension? Or are you running a werewolf game where everyone's starting at rank 2 at Fostern? You know, how did it get that point? Why is it starting at that point? Because that starting point is part of your story. Knowing where they are starting off helps you determine where your end point is going to be. Or what your end point can be. And this is really just something you have to figure out yourself. Every game has to start somewhere. Every movie, every adventure starts somewhere. I always recommend uh, someone read Joseph Campbell, Hero of a Thousand Faces. That's always a great idea for story building but it also has some great examples for how the heroes start off because you're not at the point of various other things you are at Joseph Campbell's The Call to Adventure when you run that first session and those players need to have the motivation to follow that call. And with that, I'm going to end this first video, this foundational video. My next video will be on GMing Shadowrun. So until then, I would like you all to remember to have fun and keep gaming.